I think we're going to go back to micro communities because the crystallization that came through centralization, that's all fracturing. The, the one world system that we're already seeing dying. Globalism is dead. The, the supply chains, everything is, is got out the window. The just-in-time system, that's all fracturing and dying and right in front of us. So I think having this sensibility where you need to get to a place where you can have community have your back. Economists and Wall Street are sounding the alarm. Investors are ignoring the parallels between 1929, 99, 2007, and today. We are absolutely in the everything bubble, and investors are now betting on the Fed, threatening to raise rates six to seven times through 2024. If the debt ceiling is raised, there will be an economic catastrophe. Learn how simple it is to add physical gold and silver to your portfolio ahead of the rise in inflation and predicted price rises. Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver, and you may be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA. Call 1-800-356-4470 and get a free investor guide today. And with the knowledge that Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top rated gold IRA dealer from 2016 to present, click on the link in the description box below for more information. And now on with the video. And boom, we're back for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winner, and I'm here as always with Dr. Bear Paul Lando coming to you live and correct from the beautiful state of Jefferson on the Smith River here on the border of California and Oregon. Uh, we are so pumped for the fall, even though it's been a little chilly, which should be fitting for today's guest, David Devine from Adapt 2030. This is going to be a great one. Uh, David's returning. It's been about, oh my gosh, two years since we've had David on. He was one of our first big guests on AlphaCast, and he was, he was so uh, cordial enough to come on when we were just a little uh, YouTube channel with 800, if, if that, subscribers, and really helped us out a lot back then. And uh, we're just really excited to catch up with David and see what he's been up to. And, and on a more metaphysical side of things, too, if we consider that Gaia or Sophia is a living consciousness entity and we're going through a consciousness expansion right now, it, you know, that could crystallize in the expansion of the physical form, too, of course. So um, there's, a you know, and you're talking about these heavenly bodies, these, these planets, David, too. I, I, I think of Rudolf Steiner and, I, and, and his notion of these, of these planets um, emanating from from earth or from consciousness and this gets a little trippier but these are these are living breathing entities themselves that are directly electrical right and are are are, are all communicating each other through the ether or through the electromagnetic whatever we want to call it right this this invisible force that you that you talk about the Berkeley, whatever we want to talk about so we are in a live like you know connected um uh, reality and I think uh, with the materialistic reduction to science that we're forced under, they refuse to look at that. And so, you know, this is really important, I think, for climate and understanding how the climate works, because we can, I personally believe we can affect the climate with our own consciousness. And that's why we've done shows about Oregon technology and Wilhelm Reich. And I think it's important because it can help us look at solutions for helping us with our farm here, with impending potential, you know, June and July frost for all we know with this grand solar minimum, what the sun's doing and understanding really what the sun is and what the plasma is and how all this affects with directly with our consciousness. So for me, it's really exciting because I believe we are finally getting into the enriched science that we really need to be diving into and through both observation and understanding the spiritual side of it more. You know, I'm not too far from an Amish farm and I just bought my first, uh, live weight sheep it was a lamb 105 pounds first time i ever they slaughtered it first time for me to butcher it so that that in itself is you know butchering uh you know a hundred pound animal after we removed the head we kept all the innards because a lot of great stuff in there with the stomach and the heart and the liver and everything to cook up but to be able to prepare that and then put it away is one thing but the amish were telling me that they lost three of their lambs to coyotes this year now you got to realize these are amish they live out there. 
they got massive dogs of different breeds that are meant to guard those sheep at night. And they still lost three. And that, that's what they're experts at their craft. That's all they do all the time for generations is grow and animal husbandry. And they are still losing, you know, herd to pests, coyotes. And then this year, the Japanese beetles were out of control. It's difficult to control them. Uh, it seems the insect world has also learned or awakened to the fact that this winter or this year coming up, it's going to be a scrimpy year for food because they were voracious. The wood bees as well, these uh, bees that bore into the wood were unstoppable monsters this year. And everybody was complaining like the wood bees were off the hook this year. So na nature has been triggered about, you know, six months to a year in advance. So the animal kingdom is already getting ready for whatever harshness is coming at us. If the Amish can't keep their animals safe, like, you know, what do you think the average person for the first year on the farm, try, I'm going to put up a fence and I'm going to have a bunch of goats out there. How do you think they're going to fare? They're going to lose all their animals, whether they're stolen or whether they're taken by wild predators. And animal theft is becoming a thing out here. Cows are disappearing out of fields. Horse disappeared over here. Like things are just disappearing off people's farms out in Tennessee. People are coming in at night and literally stealing their animals. And, you know, the reports of, you know, things getting picked off trees here and uh, just things disappearing out of gardens. You know, there's pumpkins. Oh, you go and there's somebody picked 30 pumpkins out of another neighbor's garden over on the other side of the hill over there. Like things just disappearing. People coming through on the roads and just stopping as uh, opportunists. Okay, that's for now. But when it does come down to it, what do you really do? I mean, I had a discussion just yesterday with an old army guy who lives a few miles from me here in Tennessee. And he was saying, see what kind of skill set they have, what asset they can provide if they're going to come in with a community to build it out, what assets or what skill set do they have to help add to the community? But then you're right. What happens when you come and they don't want anything to do with what except you have inside and they're going to come and take it. Issues to be thought about in terms of security around the place and how far are you going to yeah. take it? How tar are you going to take it? Because they are not going to stop until they get what is ever in your place. That includes people. So yeah. are you, you know, you're really going to have to make some seriously on the second spot choices here. Yeah, I think one great solution to this, and we're seeing it in to some respects here. We had a slew of thefts here in the summer. Oh, you did and, too. And, yeah, and, happening here. And actually, it was uh, automobiles being stolen, and and things that were really doesn't happen here. So, what did they do? What happened here? A community galvanized, came together, came up with solutions. Community watch. And I think one thing that's important to stress here is the power of community and the idea of being a lone wolf is not viable. Mm -hmm. And um, so that whole concept of being the lone wolf gunman on uh, survival prepper, that has to go out your consciousness right away. Um, it's going to be, I think, a, co a combination of decentralization with the ability to barter and have your own means of doing commerce, right? And that can be in pockets throughout the whole world by using digital, but then two, having communities. And I think that has to relate to this new age of the Aquarian mindset. I think we're going to go back to micro communities because the crystallization that came through centralization, that's all fracturing. The, the one world system that we're already seeing dying, globalism is dead. The, the supply chains, everything is, is gone out the window. The just-in-time system, that's all fracturing and dying and right in front of us. So I think having this sensibility where you need to get to a place where you can have community have your back. And that's what we really promote here with Alpha Vedic. And we're seeing while Bear is mentioning, yeah, we are, we do have some of that Silicon Valley type coming in, buying stuff sight unseen. We also have a huge bit of our community moving up here. And what we really like is the idea of being sovereign on your own land in a community where sovereigns connect. And so it's like, hey, what are you really good at doing? Well, I'm really good at growing hemp. And hemp, I think, is a great, by the way, you're talking about soy and stuff. And um, uh, Lee in here was mentioning, because he's in Asia, how um, uh, hemp has become a great uh, solution for the soy. But um, but uh, having that ability to be like, okay, you focus on that. We're going to focus on this. We'll work together uh, and we'll have our confederation here in our locality in the United States. That's why Bear and I like to focus on counties versus states because you have a sheriff. And if you're in a place that has a sheriff that has your back, 
you have now a much more stratified defense mechanism than um, than think, looking at it in a broader state. But that being said, we're also more fan of having your own sovereign land than like the commune idea, because I've seen the commune idea fracture and be weird and people get upset and disoriented from you're not doing enough. So we did a three part series, David, on land patents because that's like an extremely important aspect moving forward, having the sovereignty on your land to protect from seizure and capture because as the agenda 2030 uh, uh, to the adapt 2030, but the agenda 2030 uh, plan, which is they know this is coming. So they're trying to get everyone in these cities, right? To get everybody into a centralized system where they can force you to eat bugs uh, and all that. The, the counter to that is by being decentralized, but also being in communities that are rural and that are robust in our sovereignty. By the way, when you were talking about um, food and um, and all that with terms of, of the bugs and that, you know what the number one thing in Silicon Valley is now? The number one like development with companies is food, is, is, is uh, synthetic food just, um, creation. That is like the number one thing that's, that Silicon Valley is focused on right now. So that'll tell you something. But yeah, but that's how Alpha Vedic is going at about it. Um, are you seeing that in your neck of the woods? I mean, you're obviously connecting with neighbors. Are you having, I mean, that seems like a positive thing that's happening as people are, are coming together in these places and working with each other on solutions in that, in that, in that idea. Yeah, and I, the synthetic food, don't they have to have a base input of ingredient in the beginning to even construct those foods? And where's well, that going to come from? Yeah, exactly. So that's what gets creepy, right? It's like, what are they doing in those labs? There, a lot of them are carbon based. Where are they getting that carbon from? Or where are they getting, um, you know, the, the core constituents of that food? That's a great point. Are we looking at potentially um, <laughs> like a sci-fi film? Like, um, uh, what was it called? Green. Uh, um, I'm Soylent green. So Soylent green. I mean, uh, so yeah, um, what it comes down to once again is getting as sovereign as you can in your food production, in your ability to control your land from centralized forces, and then getting activated in your community. We had, uh, uh, you know, we've been uh, involved somewhat with the bears with Owen Benjamin because um, whether you agree with all of what he says, he's a funny guy, I love him to death but he has galvanized uh, a, a global community around this concept, right? Of becoming more and more sovereign with your food production, embracing older tried and true technologies um, that don't rely upon a centralized system or centralized technologies or the grid. Uh, and while I am not a Luddite, and I believe in the ability for technologies as a tool to help us. I also very much appreciate tried and true stuff. Like we just, my wife just got back from visiting family in Santa Barbara and brought back an 1889 food mill from her great, great grandmother. And I'm telling you, Bear, this thing's like a hundred pounds. I mean, they just don't make stuff like this anymore. So being able to embrace those old technologies is extremely important as well. And we just need to be with it. We need to help each other out and really get as sovereign as we can be. Yeah, well, I will tell you one of the ends here, at least uh, I joined the Beekeepers Association and, you know, people who are keeping bees and plus I, I got three hives out here. And then the person who's mentoring me also has uh, five hives out here because I have a pretty I have 23 acres in the back. So getting into a local community that's already involved in some sort of animal husbandry, beekeeping or gardening itself. And then there's a lot of, uh, you know, 3% groups that are around here, especially with the uh, EMT training and, and sort of thing like that. So there's many ways to put your fingers into where you want to be and meet some of the right people. Now, my next step is trying to find people who can come out here every single month, teach me about wild foraging as we walk around and make a food map of the land month by month, season by season. That way we know we have a full working supermarket up here in the forest that we can walk around. But to find these types of people, I'm having difficulty. You know, people who really know the true knowledge of wild foraging that can almost identify everything that's in this area and then spend the time to roll around with your bumbling, you know, what's this, what's that? can we make it and can you eat this? Can you make it into medicine? And a million questions after every plant species identified. Go ahead, Bear. I was going to say, now's the time to yeah. engage with the elders. Find your elders and get with them and, and implore them to help educate those coming in. 
Um, and speaking of elders, someone I highly respect, Bear Lando, you have the floor. You know, I, I hear you, David. In, in this area, we have a, a very large Native American population. And um, we're actually been teaching classes, gardening classes, and you name it. And, uh, you know, a good number of them have been coming to our uh, get togethers. And much to our dismay, uh, as we've tried to pick their brains as far as, you know, okay, they're indigenous and, and generational in this area, they've lost sight completely for the most part of uh, just wild crafting or what the heck, uh, you know, is growing under their ancestral land in the first place. So it's been an interesting phenomena because uh, in some ways we've actually been playing a role of teaching some of these folks that we were hoping to learn from. And, uh, you know, especially going out in the forest and wildland areas and identifying native species and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I think it might be part of that old uh, Hopi philosophy too, you know, where they say the, the children, their children, uh, ancestors would return, you know, and, you know, and be um, members of the different racial groups that would later inhabit the areas. And, and, and I think we're kind of seeing a cyclic changes too, as far as uh, people embodying, you know, with different past experiences and things. And uh, also the people that you would assume know the most um, actually are actually know the least. Uh, you know, not to take anything away from anybody, but um, yeah, it's hard to find mentors. And that's one thing that we are doing is holding workshops and things here from everything from cultivating mushrooms to, you know, just gardening and so forth. Now, I wanted to mention one other thing. Um, you know, we talk about supply chain shortage. Right now, we are already making large purchases for our um fertilizer needs for next growing season. Every year we've been on this land, we've, we've grown, uh, you know, more and more topsoil that is viable. So we have to do less and less, but still we want to uh, open up other areas and it takes a little bit of priming with certain fertilizers and things to get the whole thing going. And uh, I think one thing that a lot of the newcomers aren't realizing is they might not even be able to buy fertilizer for their tomatoes in their little raised beds when they move up here. What kind of price increase are you seeing then across the board for fertilizers now that you're purchasing? I would estimate we, you know, we purchase regularly. I would estimate oh, about, oh, in the last 10 years, we've seen them go up about 40%. Yeah, because the ammonia factories are shutting down and a lot of natural gas shortages here, there and everywhere. And the fertilizer factories themselves the ammonia factory are just shutting down completely. So you have to ask yourself, how long would it be a to restaff it and then get that thing up running from zero to bringing the trucks back in and getting whatever they need as base to manufacture. And then they're going to need the packaging for that. And the supply chains of this and coming in and out. And a lot of truck drivers are just saying no jabba jabba do in my body either. So then there's less truck drivers and, where does it begin once it stops? The whole thing of it stopping and going idle should send shivers down your spine. It should. But then the next thing, how does it restart? Or doesn't it? And if you don't have fertilizers, you have to think about it. This is another uh, aspect of coming into next year. If we're seeing it on the individual level of not enough fertilizer, then on the commercial level, what happens if they can't get their full supply of potash and other fertilizers they're used to? I use triple 10 sometimes, triple 19. I use a, a different variety of organics and uh, the, the kelp and the mycorrhiza and, and a different array of things that's, you know, it's not on the store shelf like it used to be either. But when it comes to the commercial level, what are the yields going to be if they're not able to get full access to fertilizers as is dependent on to get these super high yields of 170 bushels per acre on corn? What happens if they're only running at 50% fertilizer supply through the whole ag business or ag arena next year? Our yields literally would be cut in half or probably more. Because you're looking at oats this year, there's almost no oat out there. The oats across the planet was a near loss this year. And the wheat in America is down to 1960s harvest level, and there are going to be Durham wheat shortages for sure. They're already talking about, will you even have some certain types of pastas coming up at the end of the year? 
So if we're seeing it already at this beginning juncture of this grand solar minimum onsetting, the economy around this whole supply chain thing starting to shatter. But the things that you need to grow food inside that supply chain are also starting to disappear, shrink, dwindle, whatever words you want to use for that. So how is that going to affect the amount of food growing? And then we get back into that feedback loop again of, wait, governments are trying to control the downfall because there's too many people that they can't provide food for, but then you just got another leg of that knocked out because there won't be enough fertilizer to boost production for more yield, which means less food and still more amounts to feed. And then the government's still stuck in the same position, but double heavy because you just knocked your production in half. So I don't, I don't have the answers. I'm just saying this is what's truly in earnest on the ground right now is something to think about for the, for and, the year inbound. And, and not, yeah, to, <laughs> not to be a, a dick, but I mean, I think America could do with a little less gluten and grain. So I mean, yeah. this is all Weed like belly, baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I was joking around in the chat too. It's like, man, Wim Hof's going to be bigger than ever. I mean, like, let's embrace the cold. <laughs> there's a lot of health. We talked about this on the first time you were here. Like, there's yeah. a while we've seen general trends where when we have minimums, we have more quote unquote disease and and death in terms of that but if we're knowledgeable and we understand what we can how we can use the cold and we've done shows on this like i i do ice baths so i actually go in the river now because our river is so damn cold it's amazing three minutes with some breath work in the river in the cold embrace the cold and you know we're built for this our bodies have the epigenetic memory of knowing how to survive and thrive with this well we'll lose the white adipose fat we'll regain the gray adipose fat by going into these processes. So Wim Hof, man, he's going to be more popular than ever with this coming mini ice age bear. <laughs> yeah. Ice baths. Uh, I agree with everything you're saying. Ice baths may not, uh, they may lose popularity when people are hungry though. <laughs> so um, yeah. the point is people don't need to be hungry. If you get more sovereign and you understand how to grow your own food and get off being with, you know, just a, a used to the traditional means of going to the grocery store and eating the crappy GMO pesticide ridden food anyways, that's you as it is. So, I mean, there's always a, a, a massive upside to these cycles. And I think we're going back to the consciousness side of things. The earth is working with our consciousness to help us get to the next level where we all need to get as a collective whole so that we can get out of this gross, dense, plane of existence that we've been mired in for thousands of years of war and and misery and slavery so maybe the earth maybe mother guy maybe sophia has given us a little kick in the ass i wanted to hear more from you and uh you know just back on the fertilizer and everything you know we do uh rely on our animals you know i got a bunch of chickens out there we use the chicken poop and everything but you still got to feed the animals you know now we have, uh, you know, solutions and, and we'll be able to ride this out. A lot of us will be, but most people won't. And I go back to the original question I had to you, uh, David, which is my biggest quandary. I don't so much worry about the, the marauders that show up with bad intentions, uh, you know, on our land. I worry more about the hungry family that looks at you with, you know, genuine needs and just saying, hey, my kids are hungry. Can you help me out? And part of me says, well, shoot, we were trying to tell you 40 years ago that this thing was, you know, in the works and coming. You didn't listen. And now you want my stuff. But then at the same time, you know, you, they appeal to your humanity. That's going to be a tough one. Yeah, Amish had the same exact conversation with, the, you know, when we were <clears throat> slaughtering the, the lamb and then, uh, you know, they wanted to do something with the pelt. So while we were, you know, getting the pelt off there and taking the organs out and putting them in a, you know, in a bucket and thing, he was saying the same thing. The Amish really understand that when this thing goes down, thousands and thousands of people are going to come rushing out to their farm. They're on 500 acres, not too far from here. But the average city person knows countryside's safe, all the food's out there. But then the average person knows way more. David's little tiny 20 acre farm over there probably doesn't have nearly as much food as the Amish do down there because the Amish, they grow food, they have 500 acres. They must have enough for everybody. We'll just go and buy it. And they, they, the Amish guys I was talking to were like, nope, we're going to just close up shop. We're going to drop a log out the front gate. We know they're going to walk over that. And the best we can do is like the Bible says, help your you know, brethren in need and that shall come back to you. And he, they're going to live by that principle of those in need, they're going to help because they do believe that giving that sustenance and that life-giving force is going to come back to them in many different ways. 
instead of like you say that lone gunman on a hill going no you're not taking any of my stuff i need my other can of peas that i saved from 1957 <laughs> you know like that's not going to work but they have it already under and i had an interesting discussion with uh, crypt, about cryptocurrency with the amish over there because they're very aware of what's going on. Don't delude yourself that they don't have access to any electrical devices and they live like they, uh, No, they're very super intelligent and understand what's going on. And they need to understand it to survive and continue the world that they have. And they understood cryptocurrency as being a direct threat to anything cash-based that they operate in. So they're trying to figure it out in these next couple of years. What happens when crypto dominates and we do go away to a cashless culture? How are they still going to exist on a cash-based, cash-basis only culture? And I said, hey, I got a few rounds of silver. I'll be happy to trade you some silver for your food. But they say, yeah, you're one guy. You got a little silver. But what about everybody else who's going to come in? Hey, you take my app. Will you take it? No. So they're thinking about bartering. And they already realize that most people are coming to consume their goods, won't have any barterables or tradables, but they'll still, they're trying, they're in a conundrum too. But going back to that whole thing, what's going to happen with the families at the front door you know, I'm going to have to ask myself the same thing is I just don't know. You, you can expect it. Don't, that's the whole thing. Expect it to happen. It's not not going to happen. It is going to happen. If you're living in the countryside at some point in the next year, somebody is going to come knocking on your door hungry. And, you know, I made, I, you know, I, I pushed that timeline to say a year because a lot of things are starting to fail now and the failures keep to, they're, they're speeding up on the second failure. So the first failure might've taken six months, but the second set of failures has taken two months. And the third set of knock-on effects is going to take a month. And then we start to get into this kind of, then it'll be two weeks, then it'll be a week, and then it'll be happening every day where there'll just be complete breakdown. And, you know, we're starting to see it everywhere from, from not enough workforce out there to keep bare minimum going. And I'm wondering what's going to happen, <clears throat> excuse me, with the grain shipments, because grain on rail is the most stable amount of business for any grain or rail shipper or anywhere. It's always grain. So what happens if, <clears throat> excuse me, if they if they have to get jab dab dude because it's a government contract like BSNF, they got a government contract. None of those guys want that thing. Then what? Even your deliveries stop. People are going to come knocking. Cities are not going to be filled again. Yeah, and once again, I think the solution is community. And get, it, this does get very spiritual, right? And in terms of, and I wasn't trying to just be a hard ass with that. I think it's trying to be basically letting people know, like, and this is what we do on our platform. And this is why we do a festival about solutions is like waking people up in the cities to understand it's like, it's time to get sovereign. It's time to start seeing this. But when they do come, if you have a community that is growing in abundance, um, to support those people and bring them in if you can. Now, if you've got roving gangs coming in and it's turning into uh, something that's very, uh, uh, you know, dangerous, um, you got to start wondering what's obviously the the corporate governments are are projecting this stuff out. So they have uh, things in place too. So you know, you got to wonder what is uh, what are they going to allow to happen? What's going to be working there? Are the military going to come in? So there's a lot of different things at play. So I don't know. I think uh, a great strategy is once again, just get crystallized with your community uh, and, and, and understand that we're in very spiritual times. And I do agree. Yeah. With the Amish there, it's like, you're going to be better by growing more and trying to support those people than, than trying to um, battle them. Uh, but also it does make sense like where our farm is, where you can kind of shut off from the world and make it very difficult for people to get to you, be in places where um, it's pretty rough. Like there's one, only one highway to really get to our town. And then it's just a bunch of backwoods, uh, you know, forest service roads. And we've talked in our town about what we do with that. Um, but still doesn't mean people aren't going to get here. So, yeah, I mean, these are all really really tough questions to answer, David. I agree. What about the tax man? You know, either the property tax itself in the county, or if you owe income tax and they put a lien on your property, and then the, at some point they'll be like, all right, if you owe, owe over this much on a lien, we're confiscating everything because we're going into a hyperinflationary event. So, Bear, I don't know if you have any, uh, you know, advice on that. 